Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and this is From His Heart. We're continuing in our series entitled Shine, How to Live the Christian Life in an Unchristian World. I believe today's message is one that will really help you, especially if you're struggling with the issue of pride. You see, no one is bulletproof, and pride is dangerous, and God doesn't take the sin of pride lightly. Today we'll see how God deals with those who cling to their pride and what we can do if we're walking the pathway to disaster. Open your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 5, for a message I've entitled, Turn Out the Lights, the Party's Over. have your Bible, please turn to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 is a great chapter. Daniel chapter 5 is written and it tells us about a specific day in history, October 11th, 539 B.C. It tells us about the death of a once powerful nation. Now, how many in this room like to watch during football season, Monday night football. Can I see your hand? You like Monday night football? You know, long before they had the really cool song by Hank Williams Jr., Are You Ready for Some Football? We used to have football when I was growing up in middle school and high school, and we had Monday night football, and it had three guys on there that everybody liked to hear. It had Frank Gifford and Howard Cosell and Dandy Don Meredith. Who remembers those days with Frank and, and Don and Al or uh, Howard? Those were fun days. And, you know, one of the things, Dandy Don, he was uh, quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys when they first started up. All throughout the 60s, he was the quarterback. Second guy inducted into the Cowboys ring uh, of fame there at the stadium right behind Bob Lilly. And Don Meredith was the color commentator. And Don Meredith, uh, he was famous for kind of having back and forth little jabs with Howard Cosell, but he was famous toward the end of the game. When the game ever got out of hand, he would begin to sing the old Willie Nelson song, Turn out the lights, the party's over. Quinn, I know you want me to inquire. I should be inquiring, but <laughs> I want you to know that was sung without any help from the sound guys. So, Kara, you get all this help. I didn't get any help. But he would sing that song, and any time uh, Dandy Don started with that song, you knew, game over. Game over. Well, did you know before Dandy Don ever sang, turn out the lights, the party's over, that's exactly what God said to Babylon and its king, co-regent king, Belshazzar. We've been studying in the book of Daniel in a series called Shine, How to Live the Christian Life in an Unchristian World, and we've found that there are four people in the book of Daniel who really shined, four exiles, four young guys, probably 14, 15, when they were taken from Jerusalem in 605 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar, who was king at that time in Babylon, taken from their homeland, taken to the pagan, pagan wicked city of Babylon, and those four guys, Daniel and his three friends, they just lived the Christian life, so to speak, in an unchristian world. They just shined for the Lord. And every chapter we see there is difficulty, but then Daniel comes on the scene, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they come on the scene, and they take a stand for the Lord, and they shine for the Lord. And Daniel chapter 5 is no different. Let me give you a little bit of background. Nebuchadnezzar has passed on. Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, he, at the end of chapter 4, he becomes a believer in Yahweh, and he puts his faith and trust in Yahweh. I think that when we get to heaven, we're going to meet Nebuchadnezzar because I think Nebuchadnezzar is going to be there. Well, that's chapter 4. Now, years have passed, and we hit uh, 539 B.C., 
and the kingdom, they've had different kings, and nobody's like Nebuchadnezzar. And now you have a king. His name is Nabonidus. He wasn't even a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. He married into the family, and uh, he married probably uh, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And they have a son together, and that son is named Belshazzar. And Nabonidus is ruling, and Belshazzar is kind of his co-ruler. And you have another nation that has risen up, and they're big and they're bad and they're hungry and they're led by Cyrus the Great. They're the Persians. Cyrus the Great founded the Persian Empire and then they, uh, he attacked the Medes and he took over the, the Median Empire and they became known as the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus is the, the king over there. And they're coming now against Babylon. Now the, the king of Babylon, uh, Nabonidus, he goes out to fight Cyrus and the Persians, and he loses, and he's taken captive. And so his son, Belshazzar, who's co-regent with his dad, he, he's there in Babylon, and they just shut up the city. They say, okay, uh, we're just gonna, you, you're not going to be able to get us. We're going to shut up the city. And you remember the city of Babylon was something to behold. 15 miles in a square, 15 miles this way, this way, this way, and this way. So a square, 15 miles, you had these walls that Herodotus, the Greek historian who lived in the 400s BC, he said the walls were 350 feet tall and they were 87 feet thick and you couldn't get in there. That was an impregnable city. The river Euphrates uh, went through the city and, uh, and they had these iron gates that would close underneath the wall and so nothing was gonna get in that city and so you have the Persians all around the city of Babylon. It's the one last little bastion of the city that's left. And the Persians, the Medo-Persian uh, armies led by Cyrus, they're there knocking on the door. This is the last night before Babylon totally falls. And look what it says is going on. Belshazzar, verse 1, the king held a great feast... For a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Hey, you got the enemies right outside the gate, and you're holding a great feast, and you're drinking wine, and you're partying it up? Yeah. When Belshazzar, verse 2, tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem in order that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. They're having a big, drunken party, and no doubt there's lots of sexual immorality going on with the wives and concubines there. And then he says, hey, let's get the, the, uh, the holy things that we took from Jerusalem. Bring them in here, and we'll drink out of them. Verse 3, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. They thumbed their nose up at God. Verse 5, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Just a hand just comes out of nowhere, this hand, not connected to anything else. It says, then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. Inebriated Belshazzar all of a sudden sobers up. You might want to put in verse 6, buzzkill, right there. It's buzzkill, right there. Because when that happens, all of a sudden, everybody sobers up. And it says in verse 7, the king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me will be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Nabonidus is first ruler in the kingdom, although he's now a captive to Cyrus. Belshazzar is second in command, and he said, you'd be third. You'd be part of this uh, little triumvirate of leaders, and you'll be third. And it says in verse 8, then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then the king was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. What was written on the wall? Four words. 
meeny, meeny, tekel, you farson. You say, what does that mean? It means turn out the lights, the party's over. That's what it means. In Willie Nelson terms, in Don Meredith terms, that's what it means. And that's basically what Daniel told them. This is the death of a nation and the death of a proud king. So what does God want to teach us today through the fall of Babylon? See, because what happened here, this is so important, what happened here can happen to an individual, it can happen to a nation, it can happen to America. Three lessons that we're to learn from this passage. There are many things that we could talk about, but three key lessons that came up in my heart. They're lessons of warning. First lesson, be careful that you don't get drunk with pride. Drunk with pride. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar is drinking. He's drinking wine. No doubt he's starting to get inebriated, and, and they're having this big uh, party for a thousand of his nobles. And they've excavated this place, and it's a huge banquet hall. And so he has all these people there. And I mean, if you've ever had a party, uh, I don't imagine very many of us have ever had a party where you've invited a thousand people. That would be a big party. You'd have to have a big place. And he did. He was king, and the wine was flowing, and people were getting intoxicated. And then they brought in the girls, and no doubt, because when you praise the false gods involved in worship back then of, of the false pagan gods was all kinds of sexual immorality, and so that was going on, and so it was a big drunken orgy, and Belshazzar is drunk with wine, and he's drunk with pride, and he's thinking he's all that in a bag of chips. And he's thinking, hey, I'm in good shape because I have this 350-foot wall and it's 87 feet thick and there's no way. I don't care how uh, many soldiers are outside my gates. They can't get in here and we're in good shape. And he, he says uh, to bring in the, the goblets and the, the uh, vessels that came from the house of uh, Yahweh in Jerusalem, and we're going to drink. And so he had the audacity to take those holy things, those sacred things, and begin to toast the gods of wood and, and stone and gold and silver. And our God defeated the God of the Jews, the God Yahweh, and he praised uh, Marduk, the God of Babylon. And that's when the hand came out. He was so filled with pride. And he, feel, he felt like, I'm bulletproof. I mean, what can, what can anyone do to me? What can Cyrus the Great possibly do to me? Hey, when I was a kid growing up, I remember a fairy tale that I was taught by my mom. It was about the gingerbread man. And there was a little saying with the fairy tale about the gingerbread man. It said, run, run, fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. I don't know if you remember that little fairy tale, but it's the story of a gingerbread man who uh, just felt like he was untouchable, unbeatable, impregnable, and then all of a sudden he comes across the fox and the fox tricks him and the fox eats him. The gingerbread man thought like Belshazzar, I am indestructible and I am bulletproof, drunk with pride. Pride will do that to you. When you are drunk with pride, stupidity knows no bounds. To take the things of God and rub God's face in it, that's when God says enough is enough. Hey, no one's bulletproof. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, there, there were reasons why Belshazzar thought he was bulletproof. I mean, his fortress seemed like it was impregnable. Historians say they, that he may have had as much as 20 years worth of supplies stored up because he knew this was getting ready to happen. And he had a water supply, and, I mean, things seemed pretty good. It's like, okay, well, you, how long can you uh, hang outside the city, uh, Cyrus the Great? Because I can hang in here and be fine in here. I'll shut up... Uh, uh, behind the walls for 20 years. You can't besiege this city for 20 years. So that's why he felt very confident. That's why he was having a big party. He felt like he was bulletproof, but nobody's bulletproof. Nobody. 
Uh, no Christian is bulletproof. God holds you in his hand. And so you're not bulletproof. Nobody's bulletproof. Now let me tell you the story here. It says that uh, his queen, his, actually the queen mother, uh, Belshazzar's mother, she comes in because Belshazzar's freaking out. Here's Buzzkill. He's all, and man, he's wide awake. I don't need any coffee now. I'm scared to death. My knees are knocking. And my uh, Babylonian brain trust, those guys, the conjurers and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans, every time they come on the scene, they're goose egg. They have nothing. They can't interpret jack squat. And so the, he calls those guys in, and they're like, well, you don't know what it means. It's like, no, duh. You don't know anything. It, it, it's God's way of saying, hey, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. And so he doesn't know what to do. His mom comes in, and she said to, says to him, hey, there's a guy in the kingdom that your father Actually, your grandfather, they don't have a word for father, so they just call him your father, but he was his grandfather. Your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he called on him a lot. His name is Daniel, and in Daniel, there's a spirit of the holy gods, and you need to call on Daniel because Daniel can interpret all sorts of stuff. There's nothing that gets past Daniel. So verse 13 he brings in Daniel. Then Daniel was brought to him, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers brought in before me, that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me. Ah, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. What a shock. But I personally have heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make this interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. I love Daniel. I love what he has to say. See, Daniel had respect for Nebuchadnezzar. He has no respect for Belshazzar. Verse 17. Then the king, Daniel, answered and said to the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. And he gives him a history lesson. O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. And because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the people's nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. He didn't take orders from anybody. He was the supreme dictator. And he says in verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of his house before you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines. You've been drinking wine from them and you've praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and your ways, you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him and this inscription was sent out. Oh, Belshazzar, you're so filled with rotten pride. And you learn nothing about the story of your grandfather. You think you're bulletproof, but nobody's bulletproof because God holds you in his hand. Your very life breath is in his hand. Will a man mock God? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And he tried to mock God. And he ended up broken. Listen, no one is able to go up against God. 
People get so proud, they think they're so tough, they think they're so indestructible. But you can't go up against God. Nobody can go up against God. He's God. And this is why no one can go up against God, because we've had, there are people in the Bible who have tried to do that. Pharaoh is a good example. Pharaoh, he fancied himself a God. And when Moses came to Pharaoh and says, thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, let my people go, Pharaoh said this. Who is the Lord, who is Yahweh, that I, that I should obey his voice? I know not Yahweh. And besides, neither will I let his people go. Well, the whole, you read in Exodus, what is the first part of Exodus all about? It's God introducing himself to Pharaoh. Oh, you what? Get to know me. You think you're tough. You think you're big. You think you're bad. God says, I'm going to humble you, and I'm going to turn you and your armies to fish food because I'm God. The Scripture says this about God. Why can no one go up against God? He says, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Watch it. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Can I tell you something that is so cool? In Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah who wrote in the 600s, around 680, 90 B.C., God put into Isaiah's heart and into his mind that there was coming a man named Cyrus. Cyrus was born in 600 B.C. So 80, 90 years before Cyrus was ever born, there is reference to Cyrus who is coming to bring judgment on the Chaldeans, on the Babylonians. And he even says how they're going to do it. God's going to dry up the river and they're going to come in and there's a gate that's going to be opened because God is the one who opens gates. And when you read the story about how Babylon fell... The, the Persians get into Babylon. You know how they do it? They take the Euphrates River that ran through the city and they go upstream and they divert the river and so it starts to dry up and he has soldiers on one end of the river and on the other end of the river on either side of the city and when the water goes down, they come in and God made it so that the people and the guards forgot to lock the gate. They had gates underneath the walls that went all the way down into the riverbed so you couldn't get in there but they forgot to lock the gate and so when the river went down, they slipped through and they took Babylon without even a fight. They just entered into the city. God said that was going to happen. He said it 150 or so years before it ever occurred. God knows the end from the beginning. That's why you can't go up against God. He is God. He knows everything. He has all power and all authority. And people try and shake their puny little fist in the face of God. They get drunk with pride. And they think they're big. And they think they're bad. Hey, be careful about that because pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. I heard about a DEA agent. We have officers and agents in our church and I love these guys, but this was a DEA agent who was kind of like Barney Fife. I mean, he thought he was all that in a bag of chips because he was a DEA agent, a federal agent, kind of like Jack Bauer. I'm a federal agent, you know, and he had a badge and he just thought he was so cool. He went to this Texas farmer one day And he said to him, he said, hey, I need to inspect your farm. He said, we've gotten word that there are some farms out here and they're growing uh, some some illegal drugs and so we need to inspect your farm and so I'm gonna gonna look out on your fields. And the farmer said to him, well, that's okay, but he said, "Don't, don't go to that field. And he pointed to an area of his farm, a particular field. And the guy looked at him and he said, hey, mister, did I tell you who I am? I'm a DEA agent. I'm a federal agent. And he whips out his badge. And he says, you see this badge? He says, this badge says I can go anywhere I want. I can do whatever I want on your property. Who are you to tell me? I have a badge. I work for the federal government. I'll go wherever I want. Farmer looked at him and said, okay, go wherever you want. He went back to his chores. About 10 minutes later, he hears that DEA agent screaming, help! Help, help. He runs to the fence, and he sees the guy running across that field. He told him not to go in, and a big bull is chasing him and gaining on him. And the guy's like, help, help, what do I do? He said, pull out your badge. (laughs) 
Badge doesn't really work with the bull, does it? Hey, there's an old saying that says, you mess with the bull, you get the horns. You shake your puny little fist in the face of God. You call God out. You say, in effect, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? You take his holy things and you begin drinking and toasting the gods of gold and silver, of wood and stone. Bam! The handwriting comes out. God says, I'm not going to be mocked. You've crossed the line, pal. God has patience, but his patience doesn't last forever. And that's when the handwriting came. Be careful that you don't get drunk with pride and think you're impregnable and think that you can handle it and think because of your money and your resources and your intellect and all that stuff. Hey, your intellect, all that comes from God. Nebuchadnezzar found that out. It all comes from God. He was a great leader, but God can just flip the switch and he can lose his mind that fast. So be careful that you don't get drunk with wine, second, with pride. Secondly, be careful that you don't blow off the warnings from God. Now, I love this when Daniel talks to Belshazzar and he gives him the history lesson about Nebuchadnezzar. He says to him, you knew this. I'm not telling you stuff that you've never heard before. You knew it. Even though, verse 22, yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew this. What, what happened there? How, you knew it. Well, you didn't do anything with it. Yeah, he's just like people today. We just blow it off. We know things about God. We know about the judgment that comes from God. But he's just like, yeah, yeah, that later. Later, I'll do that later, you know. And, and you know what's interesting? When he was participating in all that sin in the early part of chapter 5, and all of a sudden the hand came out and began to write, he knew immediately that it was judgment against him because his conscience began to accuse him of all his sin. You know, if all of a sudden a hand showed up in the back of our uh, wall and began to write, you know, I, I would wonder what it said, but I wouldn't, my knees wouldn't necessarily start knocking together because I wouldn't think this is judgment against uh, us or against the house or against me. But if I am living in sin, open, unconfessed sin before the Lord, and something like that happened, I'd be really scared. He knew that he shouldn't be doing that stuff, but he did it anyway, and he was blowing off the warnings from God. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, in the Old Testament, God just seems like he's a God of wrath. I mean, he's just throwing down thunderbolts. He's wiping out whole cities. Sodom and Gomorrah, he turns them to toast and uh, tells, he, he tells uh, Saul, take the, the Amalekites and wipe them all out. Children, infants, everything. Just kill them all, all their animals, all, all, every one of them. And people read that stuff and they say, well, you know, that God of the Old Testament, I sure don't like him. He just seems like he's capricious, like, you know, he's got a hair trigger temper and you do something and it's bam, you know, and he just swats you like a fly. The, the, the New Testament God, Jesus, why, well, he's, he's the one that I connect with because he's so kind and gentle and merciful and loving. Do you not understand that the Jesus of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament? The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. God is one and God is in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and it's the same God. What we fail to realize is this. God is so patient, but his patience doesn't last forever. And when you read about God raining down fire and brimstone, let me tell you, that comes after God has put up with those people and put up with those people and put up with those people and has sent messengers to those people and messengers to those people, and they blow them off and blow them off and blow them off and blow them off, and finally, judgment comes. Don't ever get the idea that you are more righteous than God, that you know more than God, that, that your standards are higher than God, and you read how God did whatever he did to this nation or that nation, you say, well, that's just wrong. God can't do that. 
God can do whatever he wants. He's God. And God is holy, and God is just, and God is loving, and God never does anything that doesn't flow out of a heart of holiness and righteousness and justice and love. So the best way when we hit some of those snags that we don't really understand, don't ever say, well, God, I'm not going to believe in you, and I'm not going to trust you because you did this, that, and the other. You just say, God, I know you're holy and righteous and just, and you would never do anything unless it was holy and righteous righteous and just and came out of a heart of love. So I don't understand it, but I know your character and I know who you are. And see, we don't, we don't have all the backstory like God does. And so here's the thing, interesting, when Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem, this is what the scripture says. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, And the Lord, Yahweh, the God of their fathers, sent word to them, to Judah, again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy. God is patient but his patience doesn't last forever. And if you keep blowing off his warnings, finally, judgment comes. Do you remember when Jesus comes into the city at Palm Sunday and they hail him and they put down the palm branches and their garments and they're, they're saying, uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes into Jerusalem and you know what he does when he gets to Jerusalem? He weeps over the city. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The, the city who stones the prophets and kills those who are sent to her, sent to warn her. He said, how I longed to gather you together like a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Now your house is left unto you desolate. There's, there's no more remedy. When you won't come and won't come and won't come, then judgment falls. It's not because God is mean and cruel. It's because you blew off his warnings. Hey, be careful that you don't do that. Some of you in this room, maybe you are living in open sin. Now, it's open to you. You've got it hidden to other people. They don't know about your adultery. They don't know that you're sleeping around. They don't know you're doing this, that, and the other. But you know, and God knows, and you come to church, and you hear messages, and the finger of God points at your heart and says, you're the man, you're the one doing this, you need to get right, you need to get clean, and you blow it off and blow it off and blow it off. Hey, you're going to go just like they went in Babylon, just like they went in Judah. If you continually blow that off, the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy. You got to get right with God while there's time. Call on the Lord while he may be found. Seek him while he's near because there's coming a time where he won't be found and he won't be near. So that's the second lesson. Be careful that you don't blow off the warnings from God. And lesson number three, be careful that you don't miss your ultimate purpose in life. I love verse 23. Let's look at it again. He says to Belshazzar, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and your ways, you have not glorified. What was his job as a human being, Belshazzar's job? It's the same job that you have, that I have, that anybody who has ever been created, who has ever been born. It's the same job we all have, and that is to glorify God. That's why God made us, to shine for him, to shine for his glory. Can you imagine living your whole life and missing your ultimate purpose? And your ultimate purpose is to glorify the one who created you, who made you, who gave you life. Isaiah 43, verse 7 says, all who claim me as their God will come, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Why did you create me, God? For my glory, for my glory, for my honor, for my fame, for the glory of my name. That's why I created you. First Corinthians chapter 10 
31 says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Philippians chapter 2 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be children of God among a crooked and perverse generation among whom we appear as lights in the world. That's what we're supposed to be. Shine the light for the Lord. To live for his glory. To let our light so shine among men that they may, people may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. He said, you're, you're in God's hand, pal. You're not protected by walls. You're not protected by gates. You're protected by the grace of God. And you're thumbing your nose up at God. And you have not glorified God. And so God is getting ready to crush you. He made you for his glory, and you're not doing what you were made to do. You say, well, Jeff, how how does a person glorify God? Well, you glorify God when you see your need and you come to him. That's what Nebuchadnezzar finally did. He saw his need, and he came to Yahweh in brokenness, in humility, in repentance, and in faith. That's, That's the only way that you can ever glorify God is you see your need for him and you come to him. Now, this is interesting because Daniel starts telling him what, what was written on the wall. He says in verse 25, this is the inscription that was written out. Mini, mini, tekel, you farson. Now, it seems like why couldn't the uh, wise men of Babylon have figured that out? And this is all written in Aramaic. Why couldn't they have figured that out? It doesn't seem that hard. This is probably how it came out. Take a look at this. That's probably what was written on the wall. They write right to left. And it uh, was maybe vertical the way it appeared. And you don't have vowels in Hebrew or Aramaic. So it's just M-N-M-N-T-Q-L-P-R-S. Well, that, that's, that's kind of, t- I mean, it looks like it's an eye exam. I can read it with that one, not with that one. I mean, you know, that's what it seems like. And so they didn't know what that was. But he says, hey, this is what it is. Meanie, meanie. That means God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. He says it twice for emphasis. This is, this is over. Turn out the lights. The party's over. Your number is up, pal. Hey, Jack. You've jacked with the wrong God, and now you're done. That's what meanie, meanie means. And then he says, tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. God put you on his scale of righteousness, and you know what? Eh, you didn't balance out. You weren't able to balance it out. You were deficient. You're a moral lightweight. That's what that word deficient means. You're too light for the scales. Here's the thing that we need to realize. All of us, every single one of us, are deficient morally before God. And without him, he puts us on the scale. We don't measure up. And here's the thing in our country. We think that we're so good And that God is lucky to have us. Adrian Rogers used to say, the average person in America is strutting his way to hell, thinking he's too good to be damned. I talked to a friend of mine the other day. He and I were going back and forth on uh, this issue that's been in the news with with Jason Collins coming out as a, a gay basketball player and Chris Broussard for ESPN standing up and saying, hey, that's not... That's not right. Homosexuality is not right. That doesn't mean that Jason Collins is a terrible person. What it means is that God has standards, and that falls outside the standards. And Chris Broussard was brutalized for saying that. And the president on down, they were cheering uh, Jason Collins for his homosexuality. I had a conversation with a guy that I went to high school with uh, through Facebook, and, and I was asking him about, I said, well, where do you get your sense of morality? And I said, and what is it going to be like when you stand before God? And he said, I feel very confident when I stand before God because I have spoken out for human rights. Oh, oh well, gee, I didn't, I didn't know that was the, the criteria. You, you speak out for human rights and, and what you think is right, and then, and then God just is like, well, that's great. 
Well, that's his thought. That's his idea that, you know, I've done some good things. Then he, then he said, but, you know, I've done some other things I'm not too proud of, and I'm going to need some forgiveness there. And I said, you know, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. But I thought about that because I thought, that's the mindset of so many people. I'm a good person, but you're not, and I'm not, and nobody is, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when you get on God's scale and God puts his righteousness on one side and puts you on the other, you know what? You're a moral lightweight. You don't balance out. You're found deficient. Have you ever seen the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? They made it again. And they got Johnny Depp to play this creepy Willy Wonka guy, you know? He's just a creep. Gene Wilder was he's kind of weird, but he wasn't creepy. But anyway, in that show, they have uh, Veruca Salt. She gets in there, and she wants to have a goose that lays these golden chocolate eggs. And she gets down in there, and Willy Wonka had said, you know, we have a, an egg meter uh, that, that tests the eggs, and it tells you whether it's a good egg or a bad egg. And if you land on that little scale, it'll tell if you're a good egg or a bad egg. And she landed on the scale, and it went, Meh, bad egg. And she went down into the place where all bad eggs go. All of us are bad eggs. We don't believe that. We don't like to think like that. You get on God's scale and it's ah, bad egg. Every single one of us. Jesus is the only one who can save, who can forgive, who can cleanse. You receive Christ and all of a sudden you go from a bad egg to a good egg because you're clothed and robed in the righteousness of God. The Bible says you think you can get to heaven by your good works for all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. We're deficient before him. And all of us without Jesus face eternal judgment. It's interesting. He gives the story and the score to Belshazzar. The last word he tells him is uh, verse 28, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Different from what was written on the wall because what was written on the wall was Eupharsin. And people have said, well, it's Eupharsin, but then he says, Perez, your kingdom has been divided. Why is that? I love what one commentator said. He said, one is future tense, Eupharsin, and one is past tense, Perez. And when the writing came on the wall, the uh, Persians were not yet into the city. But some hours have passed, and now they've already gotten in. And Daniel is so smart, he's so in tune with God, that God tells him, this has already taken place. It's a done deal. So you write Perez, which is the past tense, and that's why he says, your kingdom has been divided, and it's already given over to the Medes and Persians. And so what does Belshazzar do? Well, he rewards Daniel for telling him what the inscription meant. You know what he should have done? He should have repented but he didn't do it. Hey, I think even though God had said, turn out the lights, the party's over, if he had gotten down on his knees and on his face and cried out to God for mercy, God would have had mercy on him, but he didn't do it. And it says in verse 30, that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. Hey, everybody faces eternal judgment without him. Do you see the similarities in this story and in America? Hey, America is drunk with wine, with drugs, with prescription drugs. America is drunk with pride. America is so involved in sexual immorality. It's all over the internet. It's everywhere you look. It's in all the movies. And kids now are, you know, with telephones and sexting. And there, there are apps that you can get to find out who wants to have sex with you on Facebook. All sorts of, of sick things that are just out there. And uh, I was reading an article to just this morning about casual sex and how college is just all about drinking and having sex. And some of the girls say, you know, uh, I met a guy two hours later, we're, we're having sex together. And he says, you know, sometimes it makes me feel kind of empty inside. Oh, really? Yeah. This one guy said, you know, that's just, just the way the society is. We have sex, and if, we, and if things go good, then, then maybe we have a date afterward. Like, 
something's really changed here. Now, that's our society. It's sex charged and sex crazed and there's blasphemy. People thumbing their nose up at God. Listen, when we start endorsing uh, sexual immorality and sexual perversion and we say that's right and we cheer it and the guy stands up and says, thus says the Lord, and we scorn him and mock him, man, we're on thin ice with the Lord because he's the one who sets up morality. He's the one who says this is right and this is wrong. America's willfully rejecting the warnings of God. We have sermons and people blow off the sermons and messages from people of God and people blow those off. Greed and materialism was obviously the order of the day in Babylon because what does Belshazzar say to Daniel? Hey, you interpret this and I'll give you some gold. I'll give you this purple robe. I'll give you this position. You, you couldn't buy Daniel. he keep your stuff. I don't care about any of your stuff. But we live in a world today where it's all about money and it's all about materialism. And people, you know how they choose a job? They choose a job based on which job pays the most money because it's all about money. And I'll sell my mother's soul if I can get more money. That's the attitude and the heart of so many people that are just eaten up with greed and materialism. Corrupt leadership. The leadership in Babylon had gotten so corrupted. Hey, the leaders in America are so corrupt. It's just common that people are lying when they get on camera. They talk about Benghazi. They just lie about it, and nobody really thinks a lot about it because it's like, well, yeah, you're, you're a politician, so lying is just conducive to being a politician. It's just the same thing. Those are just synonyms. It didn't used to be like that, but it's like that now. You know, when you start lying for a living, what do you have? You know, I talk to couples and they're having problems. I always tell them, listen, you have got to be honest because if you are not honest, you have nothing. You don't, there's nothing to build on. There's no trust. And in our country, corrupt leadership, people who tell lies. And I believe that the Lord is saying, how I long to gather you to myself like a hen would gather her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want to come to me. You didn't want my will. You didn't want my ways. You didn't want my word. So not my will, God says, but yours be done. What is it like when you stand before God and you are cast into hell? I believe the Lord says with tears in his eyes, not my will, but yours be done. I died for you. I did everything I could to, uh, to get you to come to me, but you were unwilling and you said no, and there's no remedy left for you. All that's left for you is judgment and destruction. God does not want that to happen. He does not want that to happen to any life. He does not want that to happen to this land. Listen, as I told you last week, Christians are the ones who hold the key, and we need to get right, and we need to stand in the gap for this land because the handwriting is getting ready to hit the wall, and God's people can make the difference. And I want to ask you as we close out today two things. Will you get right with God, number one? And number two, will you pray? Will you pray for America? I know some of you moms and dads and, and grandparents, listen, you get concerned about the world that your kids are growing up in, and you should be concerned. But we trust in God as we sang that song, I will trust in you, and God will provide for his own. And Daniel was sent to Babylon, and Daniel made an impact in the city of Babylon. And just as Quinn said, those guys who are standing up for the Lord, they can make an impact in their middle school and in their high school, and we can make an impact in this community. And through television and radio, we can make an impact all throughout the world. And I want to ask you to get with me. And I want to ask you to stand up right now and say, God, we're going to trust you. We're going to pray. We're going to get right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. My friend, God really does want your life to count for him. He wants you to shine for Jesus Christ. And maybe you're watching today and, and you say, Jeff, you know, I, I can't really shine because there's nothing inside to come out. I don't know if I have this personal relationship with Jesus. Well, listen, I appreciate your honesty. And you need to know today is the day for you. The Lord loves you, and he wants to come into your life. He wants to change your life forever, and he wants to do it today. So would you pray this prayer with me from your heart? Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, 
and I'm lost. I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe that you rose again from the dead. And Lord, I believe you are God in the flesh. And right now, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord, be my Savior, change my life forever. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can help you and pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Pastor Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real